Did you know one in ten women of reproductive age suffer from endometriosis? 10% of women worldwide suffer from endometriosis, all right? That's about 176 million women worldwide. Endometriosis is actually the second most common condition or the gynecological condition in the world. Today, especially, we'll be talking and focusing on the adolescents. If your daughter is going through endometriosis, how would you get to know and how do you help her get through it? To start us off, we have an amazing, amazing endo warrior and she's here to share her journey and her story with endometriosis and now she's maneuvering, all right? Up next. Hi, I am Jackie and I have endometriosis. I was diagnosed with endometriosis in 2012, though I had had it for quite a while. But 2012 is when I had surgery and it was diagnosed. So endometriosis is basically a chronic health condition where the cells that are supposed to be in your uterus that shed every month in a woman's monthly cycle are found in other parts of her body. So these cells, they shed every month just as they would inside her uterus, wherever they are found. And when this happens, it causes lesions or scar tissue. This scar tissue in turn causes inflammation and a lot of pain. The symptoms vary from woman to woman, but for me personally, what I can say is pain is, is the major symptom. And it's not just, you know, usual pain where you can just take a painkiller a tablet and you'll be fine. I'll go through the medicine cabinet taking prescription painkillers and you'll find that none of them will work, the pain will not reduce. Uh, more often than not I'm not able to eat when I'm in that much pain. So what happens is that I end up in hospital getting painkillers intravenously to reduce the pain and to reduce the inflammation. I had been in pain for so long, every month, I was in a lot of pain. It was the kind of pain that you know you can't get out of bed, you can't do the normal things that you should be able to do on a daily basis. And it wasn't just once in a blue moon, it was continuous. So when I'd go to doctors with the pain, some would say it's pain is normal, it, it comes with being a woman. But you'd find other doctors who'd be like, there's more to this. You need to find out what's, what's really going on, what's behind the pain. I had mixed feelings once I was diagnosed. One is I didn't know a lot about the condition. So, you know, you run to Google and you start trying to Google what is endometriosis. And the internet can be scary, especially when you have a health condition. So that took me aback. There was also a bunch of changes that I needed to make. The more reading and the more information that I got, I realized that I needed to change my lifestyle completely. And the reason why this is so important is, especially with endometriosis, you'll find that the blood around the pelvic area and the uterus area is stagnated. So the stretches help to promote blood flow and you'll find the muscles are quite tight, so it loosens up the muscles. And I like to do them maybe at least four times a week especially during the COVID time when you're just at home, you're seated for a long period of time. These stretches are good to just get the blood flowing to your thighs, your pelvic area, your uterus area. So just like any other chronic health condition, it's important to live a healthy lifestyle, which means that you have to include exercise. So before COVID, my husband and I would go to the gym at least four times a week early in the morning but now due to the lockdown you'll find that we walk and run either at Karura or Jaffrey's wherever is open and available so it's important to just get the blood circulation flowing throughout your body it's important to keep moving keep your mobility going especially during this period of time um, and when you do have a chronic health condition it's easy to get in an anxious mind frame or a negative mind frame. So getting outside, getting some exercise in, whether it's just a stroll or a walk or a jog, some stretching, that helps to just 
promote the endorphins, the happy hormones. So you don't feel as anxious, you don't feel any negative energy. It helps to combat that. So just like somebody who has diabetes would avoid sugar, I had to start reading about the things I needed to avoid and the things that I needed to start doing. So I can say when I discovered that I had endometriosis, um, the two major changes that I had were both my mind frame and my diet. So just like with any other health, chronic health condition, with endometriosis you also have to make sure that your immune system is boosted, you need to get in your fruits and your vegetables daily. So for me I like to make either pineapple based smoothie or juice every day. And the reason why I like pineapple is because it's anti-inflammatory. With endometriosis, it's inflammation that causes so much pain. So we have the pineapple. Today I'm adding some carrots into my juice. Reason why carrot is also good because if you have a hormonal imbalance and you have excess estrogen, then carrots help to repel and get rid of the excess estrogen. And then I always have something green, whether it's spinach or kale. Today I'm going with spinach and superfoods. There's chia seeds, ashwagandha, which is great if you have any stress or anxiety, and then moringa. Okay, so one of the, my essential tea, I take it every day, sometimes just as a snack when I'm having a chapo and tea, but always before I go to bed, I'll have turmeric tea. So this one I've got that's pre-packaged. There's some turmeric in here, there's ashwagandha, there's some reshi mushrooms also. The reason why I love turmeric is that it's anti-inflammatory and it just promotes overall, overall well-being. It's an immune booster. But I've also got a couple of spices that I like to add to the turmeric tea even though I've already got a pre-mixed. So if you don't have something that's pre-mixed, you can just get turmeric that's either ground or the fresh turmeric and just grind it yourself. So we'll start off with the turmeric base. Next I'm going to add some black pepper. With turmeric you need to add even just a hint of black pepper. I like to put a lot of ginger in my tea. I'm adding some cardamom. I just love the, the taste of cardamom some cloves and then just let that simmer for a while. So another benefit of the turmeric tea is that it's great if you have insomnia. It helps you sleep together with the other spices and also with endometriosis sometimes when you have a flare you'll get the pain, the nausea and you may not feel like eating. So ginger is also great for the pain, the turmeric is great for the inflammation. So it's literally my staple drink. I have it every day. I'll just leave a sufria on the fire. Then I just now warm up when I'm ready to have my tea. My tea is just about ready. And into my cup, I'm just gonna put some coconut milk. I've been off dairy for as long as I can remember. So my tea is done. I'm just gonna sieve it into my cup and Put some honey, raw honey to taste. And this has ended up being my staple snack, a gluten-free chapo and turmeric tea. I use a variety of supplements for endometriosis. Some are specific to endo and try to naturally balance hormones. Some are immune boosters. The one thing that I am, that's constant in my medicine cabinet is turmeric or curcumin because it's anti-inflammatory. The rest I vary with, sometimes I'm on this, sometimes I'm off, but I think it is important to take supplements so that you can boost the immunity, reduce the inflammation, and also see what you can do to help your body heal itself. Last year, I started an Instagram page, a blog, so to speak, about endometriosis, just trying to create awareness because a lot of people don't know what endometriosis is. And then from a perspective of somebody who has endometriosis, a lot of people don't know what 
we go through month to month or day to day, it's not just a painful period. There's the chronic fatigue. And also for women who have endometriosis, as I read and get, gather information, there's so many changes that we need to make that people don't realize. So I decided to share this information just to create awareness for the public in general and also so that other women with endometriosis can look at my blog and be like, okay, I'm not alone in how I'm feeling. And then, you know, the tips that I share, somebody can be like, hey, this worked for her, it may work for me. You know, you read the internet and the internet tells you there are a whole bunch of symptoms or you should be feeling like this and it's, it's very scary. You talk to the doctors and doctors are like, you have to rush and have a baby or you won't be able to have a baby. Others will tell you, you need to have a baby now and that will reverse your endometriosis. And it can be very overwhelming. It can bring on stress that even adds to the endometriosis. So I had to take a step back and just not see me, myself, as you know, all women who have endometriosis, but Jackie, what are my symptoms? What is my endometriosis? So once I focused on myself and you shut out the other voices, you realize, okay, my symptoms are not that bad. I have the pain and I get chronic fatigue. But when you read the internet on all the other lists, I'm grateful that I don't have those other symptoms. And then um, just also trying to discover what I wanted. You know, it's not have a baby now or you won't be able to have it. And that can make you panic. But just taking a step back and making decisions based on what I want and based on where my endometriosis is at that particular time. There's a lot of stigma when it comes to reproductive issues. And I've witnessed it myself when, you know, you come out and you're like, I have endometriosis. People will just dash to, does that mean you can't have a baby? Or, you know, you already get judged based on stigma and what society deems that a woman should be doing. A woman should have a baby by now or even just talking about periods in general, it's not open. So there are some women who still feel like they're not able to be open with it, but they do want to get help, they do want to get support. So they won't comment on a post, but they'll DM me, they'll text me, they'll call me to talk about it, but they won't actually put it out there. So the emotional impact of endometriosis, I can say with somebody else who has a chronic health condition, it's easy to get caught up and feel sorry for yourself that, oh, I'm sick, I have this health condition. But you have to get your mindset out of that and rather than feel like a victim or feel sorry for yourself, it's like switch to warrior mode. So it takes effort to put yourself in that place, especially when you do have a flair because it can be frustrating, it can be overwhelming, it can put you down emotionally. So you'll find that even after a flare, it'll take a few days just to get your mindset back to a positive mindset and be like, okay, I was down, let me get back up and fight. And um, what does help also is I'll start each morning with a positive thought. I start it off with a positive thought from the Bible and that will get me through the day because that thought is constantly at the back of your mind if there's any stress or anxiety or feeling of woye me or that thought helps you to get out of that mindset into a positive mindset. The other thing that I do is before going to bed, there's a practice, I have a practice, my husband and I have a practice of just saying what we're grateful for, for that day. So having that mindset also brings about, it counters any negativity or any negative feelings. It doesn't matter whether we've just come from the hospital and I've had an endo flare or whether it's a bad day, I still have to come up with three things that I'm grateful for in that day. And that mindset helps to counteract any negativity, any, I guess, anxiety or stress that comes up with the, the emotions of having endometriosis and an endo flare. So you start the day off with a positive note and you end the day with a positive note. And especially right now with COVID, there can be so much negativity, you know, people's businesses aren't going the way they should be. There's so much bad news on the TV. So it takes effort now to put that aside and just 
continue trying to cultivate a positive mindset and uh, cultivate gratitude and joy. I started interviewing even gynecologists and physicians about endometriosis so that it's not just my perspective, there's also the doctor's perspective. In future, I'll talk to a psychologist about also the emotional impact of endometriosis. So these are all lined up for my blog so that it's a holistic approach because endometriosis, just like any other chronic health condition, it's not just your physical that's affected. There's the emotional imbalance, there's that all the effects that come with it, there's you know your nutrition. So it's gonna be a holistic, or rather in the works it is a holistic approach to endometriosis. When I say that endometriosis affects your entire well-being and your entire different aspects of your life. For example, I decided to choose to be self-employed because you don't know whether how many days off you're going to need a month. But the other women who don't have that luxury of being self-employed, they're in the workplace and you know you only have a certain number of days off in a month or in a year. But this woman may need to take more time off. She may have days where she needs to work from home. And it's not that she's slacking off or that she's lazy, it's that you know, she literally, her body has shut down and she needs this. So I'd also say for HR or people in the workspace, also look at women as an individual. What does so-and-so need? What is she going through? Why does she need this? And just have a little more compassion and understanding. And just because I've put it out there that I have endometriosis, I choose not to be defined by it. I'm so much more. I'm a photographer, a content creator, an entrepreneur, a wife, and an endo warrior. What a beautiful story. So today we are talking about endometriosis and up next is Ask a Doctor. And this time we have a gynecologist in the building. His name is Dr. Chris Obuaka. Hello everybody. My name is Dr. Christopher Obuaka. I'm a consultant obstetrician gynecologist. I'm based at Gilead Women's Center, which is in NSSF building in Upper Hill. It's a great pleasure to be on KTN Life and Style today. A bunch of questions that were sent in. We'll try and um, go through your questions one by one. Hopefully we're able to answer as many of them as we can in the time that we have. Um, so welcome again and uh, thank you for having me on the show. Uh, the first question that came was how often should I visit my gynecologist and why should I visit my gynecologist? Um, so how often? Um, no straight answer to that. It depends on your particular set of um, circumstances, your own personal needs, wants and requirements. Uh, for example, if you're pregnant, you may need to see your gynecologist every two to six weeks, depending on the stage of your pregnancy and whether it's high-risk pregnancy or a low-risk pregnancy. If you're having recurrent infections, you may need to see your gynecologist every month. If you're having your regular pap smears, you may need to see them every one to five years, also depending on different circumstances. So really, um, the number of times you should see your gynecologist or how often you should see your gynecologist is really determined by uh, what your needs are. Um, why it's important to visit your gynecologist, of course, is um, one, so that you can get a good understanding of your own sexual and reproductive health. It's important that you know about your body, you know what's normal, you know what's not normal, you know um, when you can wait until tomorrow and um, also when you need to see your doctor the very same day. Um, so that's important. Uh, education is a very big part of why you should see your gynecologist. Um, as well, uh, in terms of picking up infections, uh, if you have an early infection, it's easier to treat. If the infection is treated early as well, then it, it's less likely to give you long-lasting symptoms. Um, for example, if you have uh, what's called pelvic inflammatory disease, if you have an infection like chlamydia or gonorrhea, then if it's not treated or managed adequately, then it could lead to infertility. Uh, but if it's treated early, then it should not affect your fertility. So that's very important. Getting your infections treated early, um, getting your infections treated the right way. Um, the next question was about menstruation. Uh, so many of you are asking about uh, uh, what's normal for my periods, what's not normal, what should I look out for, what, when should I be worried. Uh, so one of the things, the common um, menstruation-related um, problems that, that we see is heavy bleeding. So you may ask, what is heavy bleeding? So uh, once you start having your periods, then you'll know what your normal flow is. 
Some people have just sporting. Um, some people just need to wear maybe one or two panty liners a day. Some people need to use a maxi pad. Some people need to use a maxi pad and a tampon at the same time. Some people would use three pads in a day. Some people would use five. So it varies from person to person. Everybody's body is very different. However, um, definitely if you're changing a pad every two to three hours, it's fully soaked. Sometimes it leaks through the pad. Even if you put on the maxi pad and it leaks through, um, then that's, that's quite a heavy period. And it's also heavy if you're bleeding so much that your blood level is going down and you're starting to get things like anemia, um, meaning your low blood level, you're starting to get dizzy, headaches, fainting episodes and things like that. Then that's quite a heavy period. And then the second thing is about painful periods. So uh, cramps, period cramps are quite common. Uh, most people would do with just, um, I mean, a, a normal over-the-counter painkiller or a water bottle or nothing at all just to wait it out. But there are some people who have very severe period pain in that they can't do anything with their lives. Uh, for the four or five days that you're on your periods, you can't go to work, you can't uh, be intimate, you can't travel, you can't be social. Um, then that kind of pain is not normal and you need to be seen for that. Um, some people have very long periods, um, so if you're bleeding more than seven days, you know, you're bleeding for two weeks, then that's abnormal as well. And then some people have irregular periods. Um, so for most people, um, I mean, the standard would be every 28, 30 days you get your period. Um, if you're getting your period twice in a month or three times in a month, then that may be a problem. Um, then uh, lots of questions as well, uh, common questions on, on endometriosis and fibroids. Uh, so somebody was asking what causes endometriosis, what causes fibroids. So in medicine there's a lot of things that we still don't know, um, lots of research still going on. So uh, specifically for endometriosis and also for fibroids, the actual cause is not known. Uh, for example, endometriosis is known as a condition of theories. Uh, so there are many theories about um, endometriosis in what way, what brings about endometriosis and what makes it worse, what makes it better, the same for fibroids. So the only thing, things that are known are risk, things that are called risk factors. Uh, so for example, for fibroids, the older you become, the more likely you are to have fibroids. If you have no children and you're older as well, then you're more likely to have fibroids. If you have a first degree female relative with fibroids, so the family history, there's a genetic component to it as well. Your children are very spaced out. You have your first child now and then you have your second child after 15 years, then your risk of developing fibroids is also higher. Um, the same for endometriosis. Uh, again, risk factors. So um, age is a risk factor for endometriosis, more common between the ages of 20 and 30. If you start your period very early, you know, maybe 11, at 11 years old, you're already having your period then that could be a risk factor for endometriosis. If you have fibroids, can be a risk factor for endometriosis because it interferes with the flow of your menstrual blood. And if it does interfere, if there's any blockage to the outflow of your menstrual blood, then you can have the blood flowing backwards, like retrograde flow through the tubes and into your pelvis. And that can be a risk factor for endometriosis. Um, in terms of controlling the symptoms, um, so there is the treatment in terms of um, symptoms, treating the symptoms, and then there's treatment in terms of treating the underlying cause. Uh, so the most common symptoms of fibroids is you can have uh, very heavy periods, you can have prolonged periods, you can have painful periods, and you can have issues to do with painful intercourse, you can have issues to do with infertility. So in terms of controlling the pain, the pain, um, there's lots of pain medication that you can get. For some people, they just need um, simple pain medication like paracetamol. Some people will need to take what are called NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like diclofenac, acyclofenac, um, Relief, uh, Relief Plus and all those uh, sort of uh, pain medication. Um, some people will just need to do with a water bottle and that takes care of their pain. For some people um, having a warm bath that helps with their pain. For some people exercise helps with their pain. So everybody is very different. Um, so for the pain, mainly is the painkillers that will take care of the pain. For the heavy flow, there is medication that you can take to reduce the, um, the quantity of your period. So there's, there is medication that helps with blood clotting so that it reduces the flow. And we frequently combine it with medication to make the uterus a bit thin. So that also helps with, um, with, with, the, with the amount of flow. Um, in terms of treating the underlying condition, for the fibroids depends on many factors. So it depends one on your fertility desires. Um, it depends on your the number of children you have, what your 
history is, what underlying conditions you have, and also depends quite a bit on the number of fibroids you have, the size of the fibroids, and the location of the fibroids. Um, so for the location, you can have fibroids in three different places. So your uterus has three main layers, the inner layer that you shed as a period every month, then you have your muscle layer or the middle layer, which is what gives you cramps um, during your period and is also what contracts when you're in labor to be able to uh, expel the baby um, during delivery. And then you have an outer layer. And then for fibroids depends, there is surgical treatment as well. So if they're very big, then they can be removed surgically. Um, the various surgeries can be done for fibroids. It can be done as an open surgery, just like a CS is done. It can be done as a laparoscopic surgery or minimal access surgery. It can also be done vaginally um, through what's called hysteroscopy. So your fibroids can be removed from uh, through a small camera, through your cervix, which looks into your uterus, and that can remove the fibroids that are on the inner part of the uterus. Uh, for endometriosis as well, there's lots of medical treatment that you can have, which is able to reduce the pain of the endometriosis, is able to help with um, uh, controlling the growth of the endometriosis, and is also able to help with uh, the fertility concerns that you may have. We are able also to do fib uh, surgery for endometriosis. So uh, the surgery for endometriosis basically is to get rid of the tissues, the endometriosis tissues, and to get rid of what are called adhesions, to be able to free everything up. That helps a, a lot with the pain and also helps with fertility. Um, then the next question was about uh, reproductive odor or um, uh, vaginal smell. Uh, to put it simply. Um, so the, the vaginal smell differs from, from lady to lady. Everybody has a different smell. Your smell is affected by very many things. First of all, your, just your general body makeup. And then it can also be affected by what you take into your system. So the vaginal odor or the secretions from your vagina are just like any other secretions. So sweat is a secretion, tears are secretions, saliva is secretions. Um, vaginal lubrication is a secretion. So if you take anything which has which is very um, has a very strong odor or very pungent in, in smell, then that can affect how your any of your secretions um, smell and taste. Um, so for example, if you take a lot of um, alcohol, then you know that can change the smell of your of your secretions. If um, you take garlic, that can change the, the, the smell and taste of your secretion. Um, things like uh, vanilla, things like uh, pineapples. So anything that you take into your system can affect. For some people, there's the smell, their vaginal smell changes uh, according to the phase of their cycle that they are in. So that so you, there's also the element of the hormonal effect um, on your on the smell of your secretions. Um, then of course a very bad smell which has not been there before then we need to rule out infections so there's uh, many many different types of infections that can give you vaginal odor what probably would give you the most pungent um, odor is what's called bacterial vaginosis uh, so bacterial vaginosis comes about when there's an imbalance in the bacteria that you have so in your whole body you have good and bad bacteria if for, if for any reason probably you take antibiotics or you douche or you you go through a significant life event that destabilizes your whole system, uh, then you have an overgrowth of the bad bacteria and that leads to the infection called bacterial vaginosis. So that typically gives a lot of watery discharge. The discharge can be very irritating to your, um, your private parts and can give you a very bad fishy, very pungent odor. Um, I think that um, covers most of the questions that we had. Um, we'll share my contacts. Uh, on, you can contact me on Instagram, you can send me email, you can give me a call, you can pay me a visit at my clinic. Um, we, we are free. Um, we're trying to break down the barriers um, uh, to accessing health. And we find that sometimes, you know, giving the clinic number or, you know, giving it to a third party to, to be able to connect you to the doctor, then that, that brings some, some barriers. So you can reach me directly. I'm, I'm free to answer your questions anytime. So thank you very much um, and have a nice day. Thank you so much, Dr. Chris, for that. Remember, you can always contribute to this conversation and ask whatever questions, you know, let's keep them coming using the hashtag KTN Life and Style. Now it's time for us to take a short commercial break, but we'll be right back.